Well, that was absolute trash, wasn't it? Let's talk about the Preds versus Blues today on Locked on Predators. Your Locked on Predators, your daily podcast on the Nashville Predators. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Predators your first listen of the day. I'm Nick Morgan. I'm a writer and editor at onthefourcheck.com, and I have a partner in crime. You do. I am Ann Kimmel. I'm a writer at onthefourcheck.com. We're going to get angry in a second, but first, I want to mention today's show is brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. Bet Online has you covered this season with more props, odds, and lines than ever before. Bet Online, where the game starts. Do you want to start, or shall I just go into it? Just jump right in, Nick. Are let, you just sure? let it, nope, let it out. Let right. it out. I have been thinking all night about what to say. <laughs> That mm-hmm. I really haven't said. We are fully aware that when you have a Predators podcast five days a week, sometimes we repeat the same things over and over again. That's just how it is. That's how this works. Mm-hmm. You know, it's the same for any TV station, any news. Sometimes, you know, you just kind of have to, the same points keep coming up over and over and over again. Um, so True. I I'm, was trying to think of a way to say what I want to say without repeating the stuff that we talked about just last week, you know, when the predators came out and had an awful game against the Edmonton Oilers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, And I couldn't find a good way to do it. And at this point I feel like it's just going to be an echo chamber. So I'm just going to sum it up with this for the Nashville predators. The Ides of March is right around the corner. The You have been warned. The seer has spoken. Mm-hmm. The doom is on its way. And whether you choose, how you react to this, are you choosing to see the danger? Or are you brushing it off as a half-assed warning? That's my question to the Nashville Predators. Ann and I have talked really since mid-February about the type of effort it's going to take into the postseason. Uh, We talked about in March about the dangers of April. Yep. We have talked a lot about how the Predators' road to the postseason is harder every week you go in because the teams you're competing against, their roads are easy. We have said this over and over and over again. At this point, I kind of feel like the scientist in any doomsday movie, you know, where he like rushes in, holds his giant clipboard and says, you know, hey, this is coming. This is a big danger. But if we take care of this now, we're going to be okay. And, you know, all this, all the politicians laugh. All, you know, it's like, (laughs) no, that's just a wild theory. We're going to be okay. Yeah. I feel like that. Mm -hmm. And I look at everything the Preds say in their pregame and their postgame conference. Um, I look at what the fans say after each loss. I look at something sometimes our own writers say. Mm -hmm. we've had conversations internally with members of on the four check. We've had conversations and seen tweets from people around other stuff. Nobody is sensing the danger. Nobody is standing up and saying that this is something we need to address now, or we're going to be doomed later. There is no urgency with the team. There is no urgency among the fan base, which is weird because we know sometimes the Predators fan base can get very reactive. True. Um, It's just, 
I, I don't think anybody is grasping the reality that we may need to grasp. And that is the Predators might play themselves out of a playoff spot. And it's, like I said, the Ides of March, right around the corner. And are you going to be Caesar taking, walking with confidence right into the Coliseum with your doom? Or are you going to heed the warnings Mm -hmm. that people have put out there for you. Yep. Like, I feel like we could just, you know, end right there, but let's not. I mean, (laughs) we could. Yeah. I mean, um, you know, it's funny. I am a a Hawktimist. I, I, I really like this team, but after that St. Louis game, I found myself mentally kind of writing a eulogy for this season. Yep. And it was the first time, I mean, like you and I have talked about it. We've talked about, you know, Hey, me, you know, heads up this April schedule, you're going to have to this, you're going to have, you know, you're going to have to this, this weekend was the first weekend where I thought we're going to have to look at some off season content pretty quick because I feel like the, you almost have to start writing a eulogy on this season. And that's not where um, it's not where I feel like the team should be. It's not where I want the team to be, but the, you know, the sands are, are slipping through the hourglass and you look at the remaining schedule, you know, two games against Calgary, Tampa Bay, Minnesota, Colorado, mercy. We do end with Arizona, but what are you going to do with that? You know, I, it's, you know, I believe in this team. I believe in the talent of this team. I believe in John Hines as a good coach of this team. And that's something that's been debated after yesterday's game. And we're we're going to talk about some of the things we're, gonna, that we're going to. Yeah. 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 We're going to, we're going to get into that. Um, but I felt like I needed to start mentally preparing a eulogy for the great things to say that were accomplished this season and the way that it ends. And gosh, that feels like crap. Here's where the things stand right now uh, in the postseason. With that loss last night, uh, the Predators are now second in the wild card. They have the same number of points as Dallas, but Dallas has a game in hand. Um, They have played the same number of games as Vegas. Vegas is four points behind, but you mentioned uh, Nashville's remaining schedule. Look at Vegas. Vegas has the Devils at home, the Capitals at home, the Sharks, the Blackhawks, And then they do have a game at Dallas, which that's going to decide a lot. And then they do Mm -hmm. have a game at St. Louis. But there's a lot of also easy games in there for the Golden Knights, who, by the way, have won seven of their last ten and are on a hot streak right now and have the likes of Jack Eichel on that team. Yeah. Uh, Dallas, a little bit tougher road. Vancouver, Edmonton, Calgary. Uh, And aforementioned Vegas, but they also have Seattle, Arizona, and the Ducks on their schedule. Yep. And uh, I look at Nashville. There's no room for error in that schedule. Mm -mm. But there is some room for error on the other team's schedule. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm not going to bad. I'm not going to make any (laughs) predictions. Uh, I have been following hockey like religiously since I was six or seven years old, which was, I'm not going to tell you the start date, but I have seen a lot of crazy things happen. And I have seen teams that I have counted out come roaring back. Um, Like you, I had for most of the season, a lot of faith. Mm hmm in this Nashville Predators team. I still would like to have faith in this Nashville Predators team. I stand by what I said 
you know, for much of the season, when they're on, I yes. think they can top any team in the Western Conference, Colorado included. I agree with that. I agree with that. It's but, just getting them on is yeah. such a challenge right now. And this is not the time. And the fact that they have coasted over the past two months, really at this point, you would say probably the past three months, the faith is waning. The faith yeah. is waning to get there. Um, and I think if that happens, uh, the eulogy that you've already been planning in your head should be interesting to hear at season's end. Because yeah. it is going to be, I don't care what David Poyle said about competitive rebuild or any of that at the beginning of the year. Uh, if the Predators don't make the postseason, this is going to be one of the biggest organizational failures in Nashville Predators history for a number of reasons. Agreed. So more to talk about from that game, uh, including UC Soros pulled after starting two games and two nights. Uh, interesting tidbits on that. Um, you know, lots lots of stuff from that game. Some good, some not, mostly <laughs> oh, not. Gosh. Mostly uh, not. But something that's always a good uh, is our friends at Athletic Greens. Um, Athletic Greens, they sent me a, a free box of their product, their AG1. Um, I wasn't a big fan of powders or anything like that. Uh, just, you know, I thought it was, you know, kind of unnecessary, too expensive, whatever. Uh, but I started taking AG1 when they sent me their free box, and I have not regretted it one bit uh, ever since. I wake up every morning with more energy even when my team lets in seven goals in the second period of a hockey game. Um, I have more mental focus throughout the day. I feel healthier. I don't feel bloated. Uh, so that is why AG1 is now a permanent part of my morning routine. So a lot of you may be asking, what is AG1? Uh, when you take one delicious scoop of AG1, you're absorbing a 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens that help you start your day right. This special grand blend of ingredients supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, focus, aging, pretty much everything. Um, you know, we talked about the price. A lot of people may balk at the price, but hey, when you really break it down, it costs you less than $3 a day. You know, that's cheaper than your morning cup of coffee if you go on a Starbucks run. Uh, and if you don't believe me, Athletic Greens has over 70, there's over 7,000 five-star reviews, including a lot of professional athletes uh, and leading health experts. So try it for yourself. Make it easy. Athletic Greens is going to give you a free one-year supply of immune-boosting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you have to do is visit athleticgreens.com slash NHL network. Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash NHL network to take ownership of your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. A uh, big story after the Preds eight to three loss to the same. <laughs> we, we got this far. We didn't even mention what the final score was. <laughs> Uh, it's so, it's almost too painful to say yeah, out loud. So if you were it? if you were listening in and you had no idea um, what happened in the game last night, uh, a don't you you can stop listening right now. Uh, don't don't do this to yourself. Uh, B, you probably should have taken some context clues from the opening that it was uh, it was not good. Disaster. Uh, big story, Ann, uh, UC Saros starts his second of the back-to-back. -back. Uh, he winds up getting pulled. David Riddick comes in, does not do a good job. Um, what are your overall thoughts on that, that whole situation? I, I think I'm definitely in the minority here because I was not surprised to see Saros start no. the back-to-back. -back. And I was not appalled by it either. And I think a lot of people were really um, 
beating the drum on why are you doing this? Why are you starting Saros? You're running him into the ground. And I feel like, look, you don't have to be Scooby-Doo to look back at the trade deadline to see they did not pick up a backup. And this is nothing against David Riddick, who, you know, I, I like well enough on the ice and I like a whole lot off the ice, really like David Riddick. But you don't have to, you know, drive the mystery machine to figure out what the end of the season was going to look like for UC Soros. I'm not sure why everyone was so surprised by it. I was not surprised by it. I was not surprised by it. Now, I hate that. I really do feel like um, Soros did not have a great, obviously Soros did not have a great game. He also had little, if any, defensive help. And in the postseason, yes. Matthias Ekholm stepped up and said, I, I think it was Ekholm or maybe it was Yossi. One of them stood up and said, we hung both goalies out to dry. We absolutely hung them out to dry. This is not on them. And he is 100% correct. So I am not... You know, a lot of people were pretty outraged, you know, in, on social media about starting Saros in back to back games. I am not surprised by it. It is what I think is the logical thing that's going to happen. I maybe would have thought start Riddick against Chicago, mm -hmm. but those were the two points that you had to have. You know, so you in John Hines is up front about you go with whoever gives you the best chance to win. That's UC Soros. I mean, that is UC Soros. So I'm not surprised. I'm not super appalled by it. Uh, I hate that it didn't turn out well, but I'm not sure why everybody is so wearing their tight underpants about this. I don't know. I don't know how else to say it. Like, I'm, well, I, I just don't, I'm not sure I get it. We talked about this on Friday, remember, when it came up and you're like, do you start Soros back to back? And I think both mm -hmm. of us were like, well, what are the choice do you have at this yeah. point? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I, I don't think that's the end all be all. I mean, they, who, who knows if the Preds would have gotten that win Chicago if UC Soros wasn't in there because, eh, Newsflash, they didn't play that well against the Blackhawks either. Nope. <laughs> uh, and there was, there was a big part of me uh, at the end when they, they started, like, pushing and swarming the net. Riley Stillman kind of broke through with five minutes left. And I was like, they're, oh they're going to get it. Like, they're going to yes. it. Uh, yeah. You know, Patrick Kane, say what you want about him, but he – he's a hockey player, man. Like I, there's a lot of chances there that I thought he had and UC Saro shut the door. Um, yeah. Ideally you would want a backup goalie that you can throw in there and uh, be like, okay, you know what? Just, just go out there and don't screw up. Mm -hmm. um, and again, I like David Riddick. I yes. really like David Riddick as a person. 100% uh, fun hockey player, mm -hmm. but he hasn't gotten the job done this year for the Nashville Predators um, to the point where he's not even a boost. He's a liability for mm -hmm. that team. Um, and that sucks because I really like David Eric. I was excited when he joined the team this year, but his numbers, you look at it across the board, aren't there. And you look at the Preds who we've talked about, we talked about it like five minutes ago. They need to win every single game from here on out. Yeah. To get into the postseason. Um, so what do you what do you do? Like yeah, what's, how are you not starting Soros? Why yeah, is like this what's, so what's, shocking? What's the other option here? It's a must-win game. You need to have a player do back to back. Yes. So and I think part of that, part of the factor as well in starting Saros in the St. Louis game is the Predators lost Jeremy Lazan in the Chicago game. Right. And when which was you tough, are, which that was a big loss. Huge, huge. And I don't think any of us maybe foresaw how huge this loss would be when we got Lazan at the trade deadline. But he really has stepped up. He fits in well defensively I think he's played very responsibly when you lose that you know you can't put in your backup goaltender when your defense is missing somebody like that and this is a defense that has sort of limped along lately 
So yeah. I just, you know, the outrage over starting Soros makes no sense to me. I mean, does it suck that, you know, he is playing as many games? He's got the second most games of any goalie this season. Does that suck? Probably, yeah. Uh, but that's, it is what it is. Like, how do you make a different decision in this weekend? You don't. You start UC Saros. You have to win every game. You put in the players who are going to win the game for you. That is UC Saros and net for the Predators. And it's not even close. Yeah. Uh, Nashville Predators have two more back-to-backs. Yeah. The season, including, <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> uh, at Tampa Bay and then against Minnesota. What could go wrong? Um, I mean, yeah, I mean, there, there is a lot of X factors here too. When you look at the Pred schedule, I mean, two back-to-backs, mm -hmm. uh, the only two games that you don't have back-to-back -back are one and done's against the Calgary Flames, both of them. Yeah. So like, it's just the, the wheels, the wheels are falling <laughs> off right now. And it's like yeah. every single game, it's like the defense looks more and more lackluster. And you know yes. what? You can make a case that maybe that's due to overuse on the defense as well. Yeah. You see, I mean, Roman Yossi's playing like 30 minutes a game almost at this point. You know, mm -hmm. Matias Ekholm's right there also in terms of yes. time. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I think back earlier in the season when, you know, everybody was kind of having like a big role and, you know, Roman Yossi didn't even have any penalty kill time, you know, right. That's because right. there's like so many other players that were stepping up and doing well on the penalty kill. And now all of a sudden this late in the season, um, one of the biggest things that surprised are like, you know, Matt Benning is kind of being used less and less. And so yeah. is Mark Borowiecki. Now they're both coming back from injuries um, but you know, when you kind of go through and obviously Dante Fabro has been hurt too. And I think that's a part of it, but when you go like check the ice times for everybody, um, kind of over, like as the season's gone on, you know, you start seeing minutes pile up for like Yossi and Eckholm yes. and Carrier, and they're starting to get smaller for players like Benning and Borowiecki when earlier this season, you know, they were the type of players that you could throw in there and know that they were going to have an impact. Um, and I don't know if it's just the direness of the playoff push and you need all these players to step up. Um, mm -hmm. Or I don't know if it's being trusted less, but it's it's been noticeable. And that's fair to ask uh, as well. Uh, more about that in just a second. Uh, plus, one good thing that came out of uh, this weekend, uh, Pete Weber and Terry Crisp oh. on the TV call one more time. Uh, that's something we'll end at in just a second. Yep. First, want to let you know this episode's brought to you by our friends at Bet Online. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all your betting stats and sports information. You can find all the latest sports developments, league reviews, and news, including this year's basketball playoffs, the start of Major League Baseball season, and of course, hockey. Bet Online is your continued source for all your sports wagering information from live betting to playoffs, esports, and more. Head to their website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. Bet Online, where the game starts. Today's show also brought to you by our friends at Built Bar. Built Bar is a protein bar that tastes like a candy bar, in some cases even better than a candy bar. If you got a lot of Easter candy and you're not too shabby about keeping it all, <laughs> uh, but you still kind of want a sweet tooth, something sweet to snack on, uh, reach for a Built Bar instead. They got something called Built Bar Puffs. They're protein-infused marshmallows covered in 100% real chocolate. Come in a lot of different flavors like banana cream pie, coconut marshmallow, and cinnamon churro. They also have a lot of traditional flavors like mint brownie, coconut, cherry barcia, white chocolate cookies and cream, mint brownie, lots of lots more uh, all built bars are low in calories low in sugar low in net carbs but high in protein so they are guaranteed to keep you full all day long at built bar they're all about the taste they make it 
they make it taste delicious first, then figure out how to make it healthy. I don't know how, but they pull it off pretty much every single time. Uh, if you don't believe me, you want to try it yourself, go to built.com. Use promo code LOCKED15 and get 15% off your order. Again, that is promo code LOCKED15 for 15% off at built.com. Um, yeah, and w- what do you think about the the concept of maybe the defense getting tired? It makes a lot of sense. I think the defense has struggled with injury. Uh, most all of them have missed some time one way or the other with injury. And I, in the ones who haven't, like you said, Yossi, Ekholm, Carrier, they're playing huge minutes. And there's just not the depth there to maybe rotate in, which surprises me because one of the things that I felt like the Predators had kind of full in the system were defensemen, but it just has not seemed to alleviate a lot of the time and the pressure on some of these top guys. And, you know, we've had Davies come in and then leave and, you know, Jeremy Lazan being gone is going to be huge down, down the road, you know, through these last couple of games. And it's going to be so much of this is going to be on the defense. Now, the offense hasn't produced either. And that's a whole nother ball game where sure. the big yeah. stars have gone cold. But um, in that disastrous record setting, horrible second period against the Blues where they allowed seven. That's right, friends. They allowed seven seven goals in the second period a record yeah a record woo look at us setting records um so much of that was defensive breakdowns and so there's something that desperately needs cleaned up and some life breathed into it and and it could be it could just be fatigue i mean that's for sure but it the defense was rough was rough well you mentioned the offense let's look at the other side of that um, because that has been a thing. I mean, we talked about how Philip Forsberg was on pace uh, to set all these records, and he's been stuck at 38 now for a while. Yeah. Um, Roman Yossi, remember, he was on points one week ago on <laughs> pace know. for 100 points, uh, and he has now just gone one point, which was a goal against Chicago, mm-hmm. his only point in his last six games. So he's going cold, yeah. um, and it's like it, – it, it's, it's like – it feels like anything that can go wrong for the Nashville Predators is going wrong. And I get yes. that every team in the NHL has a weird stretch like that where it's just – it feels like the world is falling apart for like mm-hmm. a three-week span. Uh, the only difference is it's happening for the Nashville Predators now in a playoff push. In the worst possible time. The worst possible time. Yeah, the worst time. Now, here's a question for you, Nick, and I've been thinking about this as we were getting ready for today. Would this podcast have the tone that it's having right now if the Predators won against Chicago and lost against St. Louis four to three? You mean both like both games? No, if if the just, you know, same thing beat Chicago, but lost four to three or Two to one against St. Louis. I mean, would it feel as how, well, horrific? Well, how would they have played? You know, if this was like, you know, I remember back, you know, the Florida Panthers game like two weeks ago, the Pittsburgh mm-hmm. Penguins game, uh, where the Predators lost, but there was a lot of things to like. You know what I'm saying? It was like they kept it on True. there. They had a lot of offensive pressure. Um, look like they actually controlled the game for a much of it. Um, if that's how the Predators came off against St. Louis and lost, um, you know, if it was one of those back and forth evenly matched games, no, I would not be. Yeah. I would yeah. not be this kind of angry about it. I probably would have been angrier about that Chicago game uh, because True. Remember, remember what we said. We said this on Friday, that Chicago game was going to tell us more about the mindset of this team than the St. Louis Blues game was. Um, And to an extent, even though the Blues wound up being an eight to three and a complete collapse, to me, the fact that the Predators really couldn't 
you know, really rip the throat out of the Chicago Blackhawks and give some credit to the Blackhawks. But to me, that was, I came out of that Chicago game thinking I'm worried. Like I don't, I don't see it. It was not a statement win. And at this point with the games that they had in front of them for their confidence, I think they needed a statement win. Now, I don't know that this is a lack of confidence in this team. And I think that's part of what is so frustrating is it's very difficult to put your finger on what in the ever loving flag nog is happening right now. Yeah. Yeah, Like what is happening? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can say, well, injuries and the defense and the offense has gone cold, but why? But But it's the same players. Yeah. Like, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it's it's like, yeah. Like, yeah, you can't really blame injuries because Roman Yossi's still there. Right. Like, Philip right. Forsberg's still there. Matt Duchesne's still there. I like, feel the like herd, the herd line, which carried your team, is still there. Yep. It's just yeah, like, I, what, I feel going? like we're grasping to try to make it make sense right now. Yeah. And, it's very difficult to piece this together it's to have the yeah. talent level that performed so well at one point that's not performing well now. It's like, you have to ask, is it fatigue? Is it injuries? Is it confidence? Is it the, me- like, what is this? It is going is to be, it? it is going to be a very interesting case study. If the worst mm-hmm. of this happens and the predators don't make the postseason. Um, or even, what or an even worse yet, if they make the postseason and lose Philip Forsberg, I mean, there is going to be an interesting case study about this Nashville Predators team uh, because they had and still do have a lot of calling cards that Stanley Cup champions have. True. And it's going to be very interesting to see at the end of the season if the Predators blow it what went wrong like that is going to be a conversation um that i potentially think could shape the future of this franchise if it gets to that point i agree um one last thing i don't want to end on a negative note never uh one of the the only cool thing oh poor terry crisp Bless. Uh, uh, he he gets one last chance in the tv booth uh, with Pete Weber, of course, as longtime fans know, this was uh, Nashville's OG broadcasting team. They for, are for the founding many, fathers. Yes, the founding fathers, as our friend Sean Smith called it. Uh, for many, many years, that was the the lead voices on the radio. Mm-hmm. That was the lead voices on the TV. Uh, Predators fans knew the team through these two guys. Uh, really cool, and to see them together one more time before, of course, Crispy retires. Absolutely amazing. And I love that the Nashville Predators put them back in the TV booth again one more time. Just there is something about hearing their voices together that is so um, nostalgic and familiar and heartwarming. And they had a wonderful ceremony during the first intermission to honor Terry Crisp. And they announced that there is going to be a crisp scholarship fund, which I think is fantastic. And they are renaming one of the arenas at Ford ice center, the Terry crisp arena. So, so worth it. This is somebody who came into a town that didn't have any hockey DNA built into it and just gifted this city the love and the knowledge and the passion as Terry Crisp would say, the passion (laughs) for hockey. So cannot honor what Terry Crisp has done enough. And also, I mean, you can't forget Pete Weber. These two are just one of the greatest things to happen. They are the best of the best. Yeah. And it's, you, you think it's, it's very lucky when you look at some of the broadcasting teams yeah, uh, oh, around yeah. the country, it is very lucky that Predators fans um, were blessed in a very non-traditional hockey market. A lot of people watching on TV really had no idea what was going on mm-hmm. for quite a lot, a long time, uh, and the fact that they had these two in the booth for that many years 
um, is really a blessing. Uh, I don't know yes. if you remember in uh, the years where they used to do hockey one on one before the game, uh, where you know it was like before the game, and just anybody who had a ticket could come down, and it was like Pete Weber would kind of teach the basics. Terry Chris would make some guest appearances, open to fans. Um, Amazing. It was Amazing. yeah. It's just these two did a lot for hockey in Tennessee. Um, and we love Willie Donick and Chris Mason. We oh, love gosh, those yes. two guys. Yes. Um, but but Pete Weber and Terry Crisp are, I think, the golden era uh, for Predators mm-hmm. broadcasting things. Um, you know, and just a just a different era of broadcasting altogether. You know, two mm-hmm. people who had personality, but also really added color and perspective to the game. Yes, what a, a just a gift. And to, again, hearing their voices watching this game made it. A, less likely for anybody to turn that game off, but just such a, they have given Nashville and and introduced Nashville to a love affair with hockey. And I don't know that anybody else anywhere could have done it better than uh, Terry Crisp and Pete Weber. Yeah. Well, that's a positive note to end on. Uh, there's more <laughs> hockey to talk about tomorrow. Oh Lord. Uh, Predators <laughs> take on the flames preview of that one. Maybe see what the players are doing, reflecting, see if they can come out with some energy because I feel like do or die. It's do or die. And they're leaning die right now. Uh, until then. And where can the people find your work online? You can find my work at onthefourcheck.com and you can find me on Twitter at Ann K underscore Mama on Ice. You can find me at onthefourcheck.com as well. If you're on Twitter, be sure to follow the show at um, LO underscore Predators. Uh, If you're watching this on YouTube, be sure to like the video, subscribe, and leave a comment. That helps the algorithm, helps get this out to more Preds fans just like you. That's going to do it for us today on Locked on Predators. Thank you for making us your first listen of the day. Back tomorrow with more Preds talk.